This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Again, I'm I'm Adam. I'm with the Audible Bleeding, and uh, we're uh, we are recording this session, uh, and we are lucky to have with us uh, Dr. Johnston and Dr. Oderich from uh, the Mayo Clinic to talk about uh, their technique for iliac branch and branch endoprosthesis. So, I won't take any more time, and I'll turn it over to them. Well, thank you uh, very much to the Audible Bleeding. Uh, staff for the chance to present our technique for endovascular iliac aneurysm repair. Uh, as most of you are aware, Dr. Oderich is an audible bleeding veteran, but uh, I'm a longtime listener, first time caller, and it's really a pleasure to be with you here today. Our disclosures are as follows. We will be presenting images from several different cases along the way to illustrate the how I do it steps but here is a representative example of a patient that we've treated with the iliac branch device, uh, just so you can have some idea of what our preoperative anatomy looks like here. So several iliac branch devices have been developed, but the only device that's currently commercially available in the United States is the Gore Iliac Branch Endoprosthesis, or IBE, and that's designed to be used in conjunction with the Gore Excluder AAA system. For those that may not be as familiar with this device, it's a two-part bifurcated system that is 23 millimeters approximately, 10 centimeters in length and has options for distal sealing in the external iliac of 10, 12, or 14 and a half millimeters. There's a second piece that's the internal iliac side branch. Uh, this is always 16 millimeters proximally to seal into the 13 millimeter gate. It's seven centimeters in length and has a distal internal iliac sealing option of 10, 12, or 14 and a half millimeters. So the first step of this procedure, just like almost any other endovascular procedure that we do, is preoperative imaging and planning. And again, like we discussed this morning, um, the importance of this step really can't be overstated. So we obtain a CT angiogram and use 3D reconstruction and terror recon for our measurements. When possible, we will image the entire aorta, including the thoracic segment. And this serves both to exclude other sites of aneurysmal disease as well as to make us aware of any severe calcific disease or mural thrombus that may be in the descending aorta, uh, descending thoracic aorta where we will park our wires. So once the imaging is complete, we will confirm that our patient meets the indications for use criteria of this device. And this includes a minimum distance from the lowest renal artery to the iliac bifurcation of 165 millimeters, adequate anatomy for the excluder stent graft system, common proximal uh, diameter of at least 17 millimeters in the common iliac, greatest common iliac diameter of over 25 millimeters. We need a one centimeter sealing zone distally, and then internal iliac artery diameters between six and 13 and a half millimeters, and an external iliac artery diameter of between six and a half and 25 millimeters. Of course, looking at our imaging, I'm also going to assess the femoral vessels to make sure that we can safely place and advance our access sheets. And once we have made measurements from our 3D reconstructions, we can draw up a proposed plan for repair. And I think especially for these multi-step procedures, it's important to identify which devices you're gonna need and in what order you're going to place them or deploy them. And another part of setting yourself up for success is identifying the uh, cranial caudal and oblique gantry angles that will give you the uh, best exposure of your target vessel and will minimize your parallax. This minimizes the number of angiograms that you need and gives you the best chance for a, a precise deployment of your device. The second step is to identify and order, if you need to, whatever ancillary tools we're going to use for the procedure. So when we do this, we use the Gore Dry Seal Sheath in both groins. And uh, it's worth keeping in mind that once you deploy your iliac branch endoprosthesis, you're then going to deploy the excluder system and you may need to upsize one of those sheets. So if you need um, two large sheets, order those ahead of time or, or have those in the room for yourself. 
The IB also uses a through and through wire access for precannulation of the internally laid gate, and we use the uh, Cook Indy snare to achieve this. For our wire systems, the uh, Truma Glide Wire is our workhorse wire for cannulation of vessels. We like the Lunderquist for supporting the IBE and the excluder systems. As I mentioned, our Metro wire is our through and through wire of choice. And then we use the uh, short tip Amplatz wire to support the delivery of the uh, stent side branch device um, in the internal iliac. When we finish the procedure with our kissing balloon dilation. We use two 14 by two centimeter balloons in the iliac branch device, and then we use the Cook Coda uh, for the aortic and common iliac balloon dilations. Again, examples of the devices that we use. Uh, everybody has their own stable of catheters that, that they like and use in their own institutions. Our workhorse catheter is the Comfy. For patients with uh, challenging angulations or anatomy, we will often then uh, move on to a SOS catheter or a Vanshee 3 uh, as needed, but certainly other options include the Simmons or the vertebral, whatever it is that, uh, that you use, but the Comfy, the SOS, and the Vanshee 3 are really our uh, go-to catheters. Step three is patient positioning and setup, room setup. We prefer to do these cases under general anesthesia. However, it's certainly possible uh, to do this with local and MAC for patients that are high risk. The patient is positioned supine. Arms can be tucked to the side. However, uh, more recently we've started doing these with the arms up over the head and this really provides a nice option for getting very lateral oblique or oblique gantry angles uh, for challenging anatomy. We prep nipple sit thighs and the gantry of the C-arm comes in from the head. Uh, the ultrasound is positioned on the patient's left side, operating surgeons on the right side, and once we have access, we'll move the ultrasound out of the way so that we can get our screen uh, in the best position for uh, viewing for the remainder of the procedure. As you can see in uh, this photo of our hybrid room, we actually physically tape our preoperative plans and measurements to the bottom of the screen. This allows for a very quick reference and it allows for the whole team, including our circulator and our scrub nurses, to be able to see the plans and measurements in real time during the case without having to move around the room. Before prepping and draping the patient, we also perform a rotational scan with our C-arm for our on-lay fusion with, preoperative, the, with our preoperative CT. And you'll see this in future images as colored rings and vessel outlines. Uh, we find that this technique really reduces our procedural radiation and contrast utilization. Step four is access. So uh, that includes access to the femoral vessels for our sheets, as well as our through and through wire access for the IBE device. So I use a percutaneous uh, approach bilaterally whenever possible, and we always use ultrasound guidance, and we'll take care to identify the femoral bifurcation, as well as any calcific uh, disease or plaques that may interfere with access or closure. We use a micropuncture set, and I will verify needle placement with fluoroscopy if the patient has particularly challenging anatomy like morbid obesity or has reduced groins, uh, or even if I just encounter any difficulty passing the micropuncture wire or sheath. Then over a Benson wire, we'll place uh, short six French sheaths and dilate the soft tissue tract using a mosquito. Uh, that helps, as we discussed earlier this morning, uh, with making sure that those uh, percloses go down nicely when it's time to close. We then will place our um, per-close devices for the pre-close technique. We'll do two on each uh, groin, deployed in the 10 o'clock and the two o'clock positions and secure those um, with uh, mosquitoes uh, on the side of the drape. At this point, we'll place eight French sheets bilaterally for pre-dilation and we will administer an IV bolus of heparin, 100 units per kilo. Our goal ACT is over 250. Once we get our goal ACT of 250, then we will upsize to the dry seal sheaths. Once the sheaths are in, um, we will then begin getting our through and through access. So we will advance a Comfy catheter and a glide wire up uh, to the distal descending thoracic aorta. We'll put our Lunderquist wire up there for support. And then again, through the IBE side in a buddy fashion, we will advance our metro or our through and through wire. And then on the contralateral side, we will advance the Indy snare. We'll snare the wire, the metro wire, bring it back down so that we have through and through access in both groins. 
Once that wire is through and through the other side, we will place mosquito clamps on both ends of that wire uh, to keep good tension on it and make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Step five is preparation and deployment of the IDE uh, main body of the device. So as you can see in the photo, this device comes with two stylets that will need to be removed on the back table. The first is in the lumen through the main body of the device uh, where that white tip is. You'll take that stylet out and you will uh, load that over your main stiff Lunderquist wire. That second stylet is in a green catheter and once this is removed, this will be where you load the through and through wire of, of your choice, uh, where we load our Metro wire. On the back side of that green catheter, you see that clear tip. And when you advance your, your through and through wire in there, you really need to see and feel your wire stop in that, the end of that clear tip. That tells you that your wire is through that catheter, through the gate, and it has been appropriately preloaded. If you don't see that, uh, then your wire is not appropriately placed and you should start over and try again. But once you see that, you can then remove the green catheter. Again, so we're now going to advance this into the dry seal sheath over both the through and through wire, which is precannulated through the internal iliac gate, and then over our stiff Lunderquist wire. Before you go ahead and advance this device in, it's important to make sure that your sheath is positioned in the distal aorta. Um, you want to make sure that that device is protected all the way up through the iliacs, and then once you have it where you're happy, you'll withdraw your sheath back. Um, but starting with it in the distal aorta is, is an important step. And again, here's just a closer view of that device uh, preloaded on the wires. One of the key steps in this procedure is to make sure that you ha haven't wrapped these two wires together. That will cause lots of headaches and misery later on. And if you find that you have um, a, an image like is displayed here with those wires wrapped, you're going to need to reorient your device until you have a parallel orientation of those wires. Um, so at this point, you'll want to position this about where you think um, that gate or lower marker is about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half above the iliac bifurcation. And then you're going to withdraw your sheath back down to below where you think the bifurcation is. At this point, we're going to confirm the location of the iliac bifurcation. And again, you can see the uh, orange ring there is where we think it is based on our onlay fusion and our registration. We're going to confirm this with some contrast to make sure that our device is precisely placed uh, before we will do our first step deployment. And so we'll show you that here. And again, as we discussed this morning in terms of positioning and placement, if we're making large adjustments, we are going to confirm again with contrast where the origin of that hypogastric is before we do our first stage deployment. Um, but as you can see here, we've deployed and have managed uh, to put that gate right where we want it, about a centimeter and a half above the origin of the internal iliac. In step six, we're going to advance the contralateral sheath up and over the aortic bifurcation into the device over that through and through wire. And really, the key maneuver here is to pull rather than push. And we'll show you what that looks like done both ways. On the left, you can see what happens when there's too much pushing and not enough pulling. You get a lot of buckling of the sheath, a lot of movement, and you can you know, displace your, your body of your device if you're, if you're not careful. Whereas if you pull from the ipsilateral side, you have a much smoother advancement uh, up and over, and it uh, saves some time as well. So at this point, we're ready to begin catheterizing uh, the internal iliac artery and placing our side branch stent. So I'll place a, a comfy catheter as a buddy system through that contralateral sheath and use a glide wire to try to cannulate the internal iliac artery. Once there is enough wire in there to support advancing the catheter, we'll advance the comfy into the internal and then exchange for the Amplatz wire, which will support delivery of that side branch stent. 
Big pitfalls of this step include perforations and dissections, and certainly a challenging anatomy will increase the risk of this happening, so it's important to shoot a quick angio once your wire is in place uh, to ensure that you haven't done one of those bad things. And here again, I just want to return briefly to the importance of preoperative planning. Um, if your iliacs are very tortuous, or if the system is um, or if the, uh, excuse me, the origin of the internal artery is very stenotic, you're probably going to need to depart from the plan that we're talking about here. So for uh, significant tortuosity where you know you're going to need additional support, we will often use a 16 French sheath and then coaxially through that place the 12 French sheath to really build support and stiffen up that system so that we can navigate tortuosity. Uh, in a case such as shown here where there's a significant uh, stenosis of the origin of the internal iliac, we will pre-dilate that lesion before trying to advance a stent uh, through that narrow area. So once our bridging stent is in good position, we will deploy that. We will complete the deployment of the main body device. And then we will do our kissing balloon angioplasty and shoot an angiogram. So again, we use a 14 by two balloon uh, to do this angio angioplasty here. And uh, it, it's important now to talk about what you're looking for on this angiogram once you've done your balloon dilation. What you wanna make sure is that you don't have a, a 1B endoleak from the internal iliac because at some point soon, we're going to move on to a next step of the procedure and we're gonna lose our wire access to the internal iliac. And fixing an endoleak at this point is much simpler um, in terms of just extending our current repair than it would be to discover this later and have to recannulate and so forth. So it's important to look for that now while you still have easy access. But if everything looks good, then we're gonna move on to the next step of the procedure. Step eight is doing the standard Gore Excluder EVAR repair. And uh, again, I know we've talked about this um, just earlier today, so I'm not gonna belabor the steps for this except to just mention some of our equipment. We also do this over an 035 Lunderquist wire. And again, we use onlay fusion to help calibrate position of the renal arteries and uh, ensure precise device deployment here. And again, um, we will typically do this from the contralateral side from the IBE device and you will need to upsize um, your sheath for this as well. Next, again, is just as a standard EVAR, we'll cannulate the gate. We do this using a Comfy and a glide wire and we will deploy uh, the iliac limb extension. And we will then go up with a coda balloon to dilate our proximal ceiling zone, our stent attachment zones, and the uh, distal ceiling zone in the common iliacs here. We use the coda for that. And finally, our last step is to really make sure that the procedure is done and a technical success before you leave the operating room. And for that, we use uh, rotational digital angiography with a cone beam CT scan. We do this with and without contrast at the conclusion of uh, all of our procedures. And what we're looking for are endoleaks, uh, especially 1A or 1B endoleaks that we can address right at the time of the procedure. And on the non-contrasted images, we are looking for adequate stent expansion, as well as any kinking or compression of limbs that uh, may have occurred during ballooning. Um, and those are, again, are things that are much, uh, much better and easier to fix while you're still in the operating room than to discover uh, later once the patient is out of the room. And just to finish this off, I will show you the completion CT angiogram of the same patient that we uh, looked at earlier. So that's it, and I will let Dr. Roderick step in and uh, open it up to the panel. Thank you very much. We, uh, I'm going to open up actually a brief poll right now. 
Um, we just have a, a couple questions that maybe we could kind of pull the audience on and then we'll, we'll discuss these. Um, but we can go back to the beginning of the, um, go back to kind of the beginning of the presentation and then uh, um, go through step by step. And uh, I think we have, we have some other definite experts on, uh, on IBE on. I know um, Dr. Schneider is on and he can uh, chime in as well. Sure. That was a, uh, a great presentation and as usual with the uh, beautiful illustrations and slides, which uh, was really helpful, so. Thanks, Darren, uh, and thanks, Lily, for doing such a great job. I think she depicted all the main steps of how we, we do this here. And I'm happy, Darren, to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, just a, a vignette about this case, you see this is a patient with a uh, significant tortuosity and it's actually a patient we were able to treat with a compassionate use of the uh, new generation excluder conformable stent and bilateral IBEs. Um, it is a patient actually had a, a colon cancer so he was pressed in time to have a colectomy and that's why we decided not to do a fenestrator repair, but um, it is impressive how actually it worked out with adequate seal despite that challenging anatomy. Yeah, looks like a very straightforward case. It's uh, <laughs> terrific. Yeah, the nephrostomy and it looked like there was a stoma and all sorts of uh, good stuff there. Um, why don't we go uh, starting with the, uh, the first step, uh, the first slide of the procedure and we can kind of get uh, comments uh, from people here. So uh, uh, preoperative planning, and uh, I certainly agree, and forever, whoever was on the conference that we had this morning, just talking about standard EVAR, uh, this was definitely stressed, the importance of planning. I mean, especially when you get into more complex cases, uh, you know, that's 90% that's of the challenge. Uh, choosing your devices, understanding the anatomy, planning your gantry, uh, angles, um, planning your access, uh, that's, that's the key to success. Um, so, uh, so this is very important. I mean, one, I think Lily highlighted, but for the audience, one thing that is very important is that these patients at some point, maybe not always, but at some point they need a CT and geography of the entire aorta all the way from the arch, all the way to the femoral bifurcation. So even if they are referred to you with an ileic aneurysm, uh, perhaps the first CT, you should check that because it's a number of patients you'll find surprises across the arch, like debris or another aneurysm that you end up having to change your plan. Uh, the second thing I would uh, quote Dr. Greenberg on that is that you don't need to do diagnostic angiographies to decide which size of stent you need. You have a perfect angiography, it's called a CT angiography. And you should go to the OR knowing exactly all the diameters and the lengths of every piece of stent you need. And you only do the angiography to find where your target is, where your reno is, your internal iliac is. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so that's the emphasis on uh, on planning. That's the, the real key to success. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So um, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, okay, good. I think that the other uh, one point to highlight here, Darren, uh, again, uh, for the audience is not always you have fusion available. Fusion is a nice way to cheat the planning because you can adjust the parallax of those rings and find out the perfect LAO or RAO or oblique caldo. Try to do that beforehand. Take a note on your planning. What is the best projection for that internal iliac artery for that renal artery and so forth? And that will help avoid an angiography that you end up having to throw away because it's not on perfect position. I think that's a really good point. It saves on contrast, it saves on fluoro time and fluoro exposure. And so uh, I do that as well. We're usually planning these on Terra Recon and, and I find out the exact, you know, obliquity and cranial caudal uh, to optimally image the iliac bifurcation, but then also to image distally in the internal iliac when I'm looking at where I'm gonna land that as well. And so 
and and also the angles up at the renal so that when I'm applying the excluder device and and like Gustavo says we we write those down and we have those on the plans that are hung up the same way in the uh, in the room uh, ahead of time and it really makes the case faster and and less radiation and contrast okay next let's go move on to the next slide because there's going to be a lot of details uh, along the way that we're going to talk about so i think there in just one comment here is make sure you know your inventory you know you're you are a fellow a resident a staff be, be, be involved on your inventory try to streamline your inventory uh, so that is efficient and these are some of the things that i like to use uh, of course there's a lot of variation between operators and it's all preference i do like the metro wire for the through and through because it's very long and it allows one of the assistants from the foot of the table to keep doing the tension uh, and kind of taking that away from the area close to the groin. But of course, you can use a glide wire. You can use a, a number of other wires for that. I, I use the Metro. Actually, the Metro is no longer available. I think they're marketing a, a similar wire called the Acrobat wire now. Um, but I use that definitely when we're going, you know, brachial femoral and things like that with through wires, because then there's utility in having the much longer wire. I, I think it's fine for, for this. I, I just use the, the standard 280 glide wire because the distances aren't quite as long and you still have a, a plenty of wire to do that. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. I think here a comment, uh, uh, Darren, about the, the snare. Um, I do like this in the snare because it's designed to be going over the wire. Sometimes when you're snaring this, it's difficult to find the right location of the snare. You have to reposition in the sack of the aneurysm. And it tends to facilitate moving the snare up and down. As uh, Lily pointed out, um, we, we, these are some of the most common catheters we use. Quite frankly, for this case, is usually a compi or a vertebral catheter. I would say 95% of the time uh, is what we use. I also like the dry seal shift because of the bleeding, you know, having body systems across the valve creates the issue of a continuous dripping of blood. And I think that that helps to minimize the bleeding. Yeah, uh, no, I agree. I think the dry seal is totally key uh, and really makes this procedure easy. The other, the other thing about the dry seal is it's really trackable and flexible to go around the bifurcation as well, in addition to being hemostatic. And, and I think that uh, there's a lot of people on the, on the call today. Uh, um, I'm not familiar with everybody's name, but I know a lot of other people have experience as well. So if others, you know, have little pearls that they want to share with the group, uh, uh, feel free to do that. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, another point I want to highlight to everybody here, and that's the nice thing about going around and seeing people operate. If you stay, where, where you are all the time, you end up just keep do, doing the same of the same. So this is something I, I started doing last year is to try to raise the arms above the head. For cases you have to do lateral or deep oblique, it, it's uh, very useful. I did get some resistance from our anesthesia colleagues at the beginning. We typically have the patient in the pre-op holding area test if they are comfortable with that. And there are some patients that can't handle or they have cervical disc disease, but I found that to be very useful um, uh, in terms of allowing less, uh, you know, basically not having the arms on the lateral and obliques, it, it, it's helpful. Do you do that for all your complex uh, aortic work now, Gustavo, like for thoracal abdominal? I can imagine for the visceral segments, probably even more helpful. Exactly, Sharif. It's it's day and night. Yeah, so I do that for my thoracic abdominals, uh, and and then if you can see my arrow, this is where we we access the brachial artery. I know you guys do percutaneously at Cornell, so I'm not sure, but I think you know I suspect you'll be able to do it from here as well. Um, being very pleased with that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I mean, one thing that, that we do differently is that uh, the majority of these cases we, we do under uh, uh, local insedation. Um, so not with general anesthesia. 
And I think that that'll come into some differences with uh, also with the fusion imaging and things like that, because uh, you have a patient who's awake and who moves, it's harder to do the uh, fusion imaging and it's probably harder to keep the uh, arms like this if you have the patient awake. But I think that that's a, that that's a good, good tip, uh, getting the arms out of the way if you can. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. I mean, this is uh, just some of the organization of the room here. And as Lily pointed out, uh, having the plans handy, taped alongside easy access for the team and the nurses helps. And that just shows the outline of our room. And you can get down to the pelvis with the gantry at the head like that easily, as opposed to coming in. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, Sharif, good point. You know, when I was trained back 100 years ago, the, the C-arm used to come at Mayo from the left side of the patient, almost always for the aortic cases. And this was something I picked up from the group in Cleveland. And I'm, I'm very happy with this unit. You can always see the head of the femur, almost always, I would say. It is a longer uh, imaging detector, always 40 centimeters. Most of the other ones are 30. So um, usually we don't have issue from this position. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide. Access. So I, th I think that uh, this was very well presented. And again, another key step, you don't want to have access complications to deal with, especially when you start getting involved in more and more complex EVAR uh, type cases. So I think this is pretty standard that most of us are working percutaneously and uh, and I think without fail, uh, most of the vascular surgeons I know are using ultrasound guidance. And I think that that's definitely the way to do it. And one of the things also is going back to the preoperative planning. You know, I look at the femorals. I know if there's a high femoral bifurcation. I know if there's femoral artery disease ahead of time before we're doing this. And then again, you're imaging with ultrasound uh, uh, live as you're gaining your access. I want, I want to point out a few things about this. Uh, in fact, the, the drawing is not really completely accurate. Uh, and I want to point out what's the difference here. You want to have this sheath, as Lily pointed out, all the way to the aortic bifurcation. The reason being, if you park the sheath here from the beginning and your device cannot cross the common elic because there is some plaque, you have to redo that maneuver. So you want to start with the sheath high. The second thing is actually, I usually have my Indy from the other side, from the contralateral side, and I put a body catheter through the ipsilateral side of the IB. The reason for that is when you're pulling the wire from the Indy, there is a tendency you want to displace the Lunderquist wire with it. And it's better if you displace on the contralateral side than if you displace in the side of the device. So those are a couple of comments. And, and the other thing is that if you do it this way, then you sometimes have a kink in the end of the wire and it's harder to feed into the uh, IBE device. So uh, doing it the opposite way, uh, um, you have the back end of the wire that's easy to feed into the preloaded contralateral limb. That's a very good point. Uh, there so it looks like you have, it looks, can you go back to that? It looks like you have 18 front, two 18 French sheets. Do you put in two large sheets and nest it with a 12, or do you put the 12 in for the, and then, and then uh, exchange it out and, and, and upsize afterwards? So to be frank with you, Sharif, I am going more and more on using a 16 French sheet up and over from the beginning. Okay. And then having the 12 to go to the internal with the car tree. And, and the reason I'll co we'll come back into that in I think the next slide or the one after, one of the pitfalls that happens, which is, a, as you guys all know, when you're introducing the bridging stand, sometimes it catches on the through and through wire and you have some difficulty and you have to mess with it a little bit to, to be able to get into the internal with the car tree. Okay, next slide. I think Lily pointed out all the main things about this. You want to make sure that the wire is really on that transparent hub of the green cannula before you take the green cannula out. 
and uh, and and the other thing may be silly. You want to make sure you have the right end of your through and through wire, and that you don't want to be confused there and load the wire from the contralateral side. You want to be loading the one from the ipsilateral side of the ID. I think the other really important thing here is that you know if your scrub nurse or tech is uh, taking this out of the package and flushing it and every preparing it on the back table, uh, they're used to just pulling out the stylets and things. They can't pull out the preloaded catheter because you won't be able to get that back in and get the wire through. So you pull out the stylets, but you leave that green catheter until you pass the through wire and you see it in that clear. Uh, 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 cap. Okay, next. I think Lily pointed out one of the most important pitfalls in this stage of the procedure is you want to make sure when the device is positioned, you don't have that wrapping. You want to do that wrapping and, and get kind of a parallel uh, position. And this actually illustrates very well that oftentimes the branch itself wants to face lateral uh, in the common iliac artery. And uh, I don't try to argue with that. I, I think that the, the branch adapts very well into the curvature there. But I'll tell you, initially when we were, when I was taught to do iliac branch devices with the Cook device, it was a, a big point to align the branch immediately in, with the origin of the internal iliac artery, and that's something that is not as important for the the Gore IB. I, I would agree. I think sometimes, just like with the excluder device limbs up in the aorta, where we cross them frequently, you can do the same thing. This is basically a smaller version of the excluder device. It's the IB component, and sometimes it actually gives you a more favorable angle to catheterize the internal iliac, and I don't think that there's an issue with patency or, or deploying the device that way. And I think this, uh, uh, we could go pretty fast, but it summarized some of the steps, including the undoing the wrapping right in the top of that wire, backing up the sheath at this stage only, uh, and then just puffing through the sheath after you adjust the uh, obliquity, usually, contralateral oblique with some caudal, you can see here the fusion being adjusted. And you want that device advanced a little bit, about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half above the origin uh, for the, the first step deployment, uh, you know, to release that portal. Okay, yeah, you definitely want to not be too low. Uh, you can pull the device down uh, later during the deployment of the device, but if you deploy it low, it's it's then hard to recover from that. So, good. Lily also pointed out about the advancement of the sheath, and I think uh, a couple of things that are important. First of all, make sure your assistant is really holding into the sheath and the device uh, so that the device doesn't move down uh, in a way that the distal edge of the portal is gonna be in the external with the cartridge. You don't want that to happen. And then the second thing is that it's more a pull, uh, pull and push movement, but you want to pull the wire uh, so that you get uh, that nice uh, transition of the sheath along into the, the portal of the IB. And again, I do this more often now with a 16 French sheath which is not quite long enough to reach the distal end of the portal, but usually you can get at least to the proximal part of the portal. Go back to the prior slide. So this is this key maneuver. I learned this from Gustavo, and I use this routinely when I'm using through wires for everything in advancing sheaths, whether it's through the arch uh, from the arm or around the aortic bifurcation. And, and maybe I do it just slightly differently, I use the clamp right at the hub of the sheath that's gonna go up and around the bifurcation, and then the other clamp to pull the wire. What I do when I'm standing on the patient's right side is my left hand in this scenario would be holding that 16 French sheath. My right hand would be advancing uh, the sheath that's gonna go up and around 
and I'd be communicating with my assistant who's pulling on that clamp to pull the sheath around the bifurcation. So I gently put a little forward pressure on while there's uh, tension being applied on that wire to pull it around the bifurcation as well. And then you watch it all under floral as you're doing it to make sure that, that you're pushing and pulling at the same speed and that the device is not buckling. And then it goes really smoothly and you can, you can, you can guide that sheath around almost any type of anatomy. It is a little more difficult, and to be fair with the case uh, on the left side of your slide, when the main body of the IBE protrudes into the aorta like that, as opposed to having a long segment common iliac artery like the right side of the slide. But again, it is very much possible to do, this is the ideal maneuver. Okay, next slide. So a few caveats I want to point out. Lily did a great job. So what you don't want to have is wrapping of your body wire and catheter with the through and through wire. So that is the time you want a little bit of tension on the through and through wire. You want to have a knowledge of where the tip of that wire is. Of course, I, I cropped the video a little bit, but you want to see the tip of the wire puff before you put your implatzer. And here you are seeing a, a bridging stent that is going into the internal without any difficulty. Uh, but as I'll show in the next slide, sometimes there is difficulty on crossing that through and through wire. Somebody had asked a uh, question um, that you were just pointing out. This wire that you're using to catheterize the internal iliac, you can get wrapped around the through wire as you do that. And you don't always recognize recognize that because oftentimes you can advance the wire and the catheter into the internal iliac artery but then in the next step when you try to advance your internal iliac component it won't advance if it gets caught and in that situation you've got to recognize that and basically you have to pull the wire out and then redo the catheterization um, to make sure that you're not wrapped around the through wire. The other thing that you, you could do, although you don't want to necessarily have to do it at that step, is to remove the through wire and then that will get rid of the wrap. Uh, I prefer just to recatheterize so that I can keep the through wire. Next. Lily pointed out a, a, a few pitfalls. Uh, again, making sure you don't damage your target by causing a perforation or a dissection. And if you do have a high grade stenosis at the origin of the internal, you might consider doing an angioplasty before you put your bridging stent because with the, the Gore IB side branch stent, it's a little larger profile and you can get caught there and have to redo the maneuver again. Now, one, one thing that I want to get your opinion on and maybe see what, what others do, I think uh, uh, that uh, Adam had this in the poll question. Uh, it's definitely uh, the use of VBX for the internal iliac component is not on label. Um, it's just with the dedicated internal iliac component. Although more and more, and probably more than 50% of the time, I use VBX. And I, I base that on diameters, on lengths, because you have a lot more selection with lengths. But more importantly, it's a much lower profile device. And so it oftentimes is easier uh, to deliver than the internal iliac component, especially if there is disease in the internal iliac artery like you're showing here. What, what are your thoughts on that, Gustavo? I, I like a lot the VBX, uh, uh, Darren, and I think it is a, a great option for this. I still use the side branch bridging stand for cases that I would say are straightforward. Uh, situations where I use the VBX, for example, if uh, I need longer stands, uh, I need to go to the branches of the internal, or if it is an up and over case, I will do that. Or if the bridging stand from the IB ends up being too long, uh, uh, that is a situation I might have to use a VBX. Now, I do think you have to be mindful with the VBX that it is a balloon expandable stand. So if you are gonna subsequent to placement cross with a very large sheath, I mean, Maybe you have to do a T-VAR or you have to do some other procedure that you have to cross with a large sheath. Or maybe if that common iliac artery is relatively narrow, 
you have to understand there is a chance of you compressing the VBX with passage of the sheaves. And there is a chance also that if it is very narrow, the lumen, that the VBX will take over the space that was previously assigned to the external with the car tree. So uh, those are things just to keep in mind. Uh, but I think what's going to evolve, actually, probably the gen next generation of uh, IBEs is going to come up, I think, with the VBX and a shorter portal as well, hopefully, to, to gain some more space in the common electric archery. No, I agree. I mean, I've, I've used it quite a bit. Um, I fortunately have not had problems, but I think that I'm also cognizant that whatever I do with subsequent maneuvers that I'm watching that I don't crush it. Um, I think the other thing with the VBX is that you, you have to do additional post dilation generally to seal in the 13 millimeter diameter um, internal iliac limb of the IBE device. And so the device will shorten uh, somewhat when you post dilate it to a larger size. So you have to be aware of that um, in terms of sizing your stents and, uh, and placing it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I think this uh, was discussed already, but this is what can happen, that the bridging stand gets, the wire of the bridging stand is wrapped on the through and through wire. And again, this is the situation that nowadays I'm considering going with the 16 French sheaf and using a, a separate 12 French sheaf. Cases as is illustrated here, this very torches case, uh, which not only was very torches, but we end up needing to go to a branch of the, internal and note that the bridging stent of the IBE is relatively short delivery system so you can run out of delivery system pretty soon and end up having to complement that with a viaban or or a VBX. I think that's a good point. Any anytime you get into more challenging and tortuous anatomy building up coaxial systems is uh, is useful and and advancing a sheath into the internal iliac, especially if you're going into distal branches and tortuous anatomy is, is the way to go. And you do want to keep your through wire. So that, uh, using the 16 French sheath allows you to do that because that really gives you a stable working, working platform. Okay, next slide. Uh, just in the interest of time here, I think that uh, the key points here is to dilate your gate of the IBE, which I do with a 14 by two balloon, and then uh, do a kissing balloon, either with the, the Cook uh, Coda or the Mob. I think the Mob is an excellent choice. And as Lily pointed out, this is the time you wanna make sure you don't have an endoleak on the internal with the car tree. That would be a, a type 1C endoleak. And if you do have it, this is the time you wanna extend. Uh, before you put your bifurcated device. So take care of that. If you think the landing zone is a little too short, after you remove the wires, it's gonna be even shorter. So go ahead and err on extending a little bit your repair on the internal wheel cartridge. Okay, good. Let's go on to the next. Here again is the standard uh, EVAR. Uh, we tend to use a flush catheter a document where the internal is, which is not shown on this segment of the video, but the fusion is calibrated. And uh, on this case, we're very aggressive on the landing zone, but you can see very precise as well. Okay, let's go on to the next. And then I think that here, uh, the, one of the messages is that oftentimes the, the limb extension on the ipsilateral side tends to be a little short. So you're on getting a little longer and you can cheat by uh, cordioning the, the ELEC extension between the, the gate of the bifurcated device and the IBE uh, and cheating and you can get a centimeter, a centimeter and a half at least on these cases there. I think the key thing in this maneuver when you're deploying that bridging ILIAC component is really visualizing uh, the bifurcation of the IBE device that you want to take advantage and get as much overlap of those components so that you don't later uh, aren't at risk for a component separation or a type 3 endo leak, but you don't want to cover up that hypogastric uh, branch. And so 
when I'm deploying that, I've got the right gantry angle. I've taken out the parallax. I might mag up so that I can see exactly that IBE bifurcation, and then I can nail it to maximize my overlap, but not uh, at all impinge on the internal iliac component. And you also have to to see if you if you deploy that internal iliac artery component a little bit too high, that's problematic too. So you don't want to do that because it's going to affect your uh, your overlap on those components there. Okay, next. Well, I think that the final technical assessment, uh, Darren, is important. Uh, trying to minimize endo leaks, uh, minimize kinks uh, with the self expandable stents usually is a very forgiven device in terms of kinks. I think that that's a, a, an advantage. And um, we tend to use now this combine spin as shown here. I think that that has been useful. Not always available, but. Yeah, I don't know that everybody does that, but I think it's a useful adjunct if you, you have it. I think for me, um, when I shoot my completions, I always, and you've got, done it here already, uh, I have the stiff guide wires and delivery systems out of the system so that you're not um, um, distorting the normal anatomy and you're gonna see how the device is gonna perform and lie uh, when the stiff delivery system is out. And then the other thing that I do in addition, and you're probably able to see it on your imaging when you do it this way, is that you wanna pull the sheets back down and you wanna look at the ends of the external iliac uh, limbs because in patients with uh, large iliac aneurysms, oftentimes those external iliacs can be tortuous and redundant. And sometimes you can, you can uh, induce or have some kinking at the end of the external limb. And in that case, you would line it with an additional self-expanding stent to eliminate that kink. And, and you're not gonna see those things if you don't take back out the sheaths and take out the stiff uh, 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 guide wires when you're doing your completion assessment. That's a very excellent point. Uh, you, 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 wanna, you wanna be able to see those kinks, I agree. Yeah, um, I think we've got just a, a couple more minutes. Um, this was uh, perfect. Uh, I think presentation that you had to really illustrate the steps and make a what can be a little bit of a complex procedure fairly straightforward and un easy to understand. Um, there are a number of additional maneuvers that sometimes we utilize when we're uh, doing the deployment off-label or using it for off-label indications. And certainly, that's not you know for promoting that, but uh, but we use it when we do it to treat patients. So. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about if you're dealing with uh, uh, the, you know, not inadequate distances from the renal to iliacs, other maneuvers you might use, or or anything special that you do, like if you're using an IV to revise a prior EVAR for a 1V endo leak? Yeah, so Darren, uh, I think that the two most common issues we have that turn to be off-label, one is a short distance between the renal artery to the Elect bifurcation, or the patient already has an EVAR and has a type 1B on the leak. We tend to do that uh, up and over the bifurcation of the aorta whenever we can. Usually it's possible to do. Uh, we described that technique in a previous publication. You can look uh, up and over IBE device and you see that. The, the, and on that scenario, it's super important you use a balloon expandable bridging stent, the VBX, and not try to use a via band self-expandable or the side branch uh, stent from the IB. The second aspect that is super common is that you don't have a, leading zone, a landing zone in the internal itself. You have to go to one of the branches of the internal. Uh, you want to ideally pick the best target, the largest, the, the one that will offer the best runoff, and most often we end up going to the posterior circulation uh, uh, branch. Uh, there is some debate whether you should do one anterior, one posterior because of issue of uh, um, sexual dysfunction, you know, if you cover both anteriors. Uh, I don't think that there is a lot of data on that, quite frankly. Uh, sometimes you can't do the posterior branch. It's too tortuous, it's kinked. If you have a large internal like RT aneurysm, you end up having to go to the anterior branch. 
Yeah, no, those are uh, good things. And I know you've, you've uh, illustrated and published the technique of going up and around an existing EVAR bifurcation. And that can also come in useful if you don't have the required 165 millimeters of length between the renal and iliac bifurcation, you can put an excluder device in first, let's say a, a 20 millimeter diameter limb, and then you can put the IBE inside of that and then cup around, up around the bifurcation using that technique. But, but you should look at Gustavo's paper and understand that technique so that you know how to advance the sheath around the bifurcation of the EVAR device without putting undue uh, downward traction on that device uh, to dislodge it. You know, run into issues that they have questions about or that has uh, additional suggestions for slick ways to deal with uh, these IBE cases. You, you were too complete and thorough, Gustavo. There's no more questions. You've answered them all. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Uh, Johnson, Dr. Uh, Oderich, and uh, Dr. Schneider for uh, talking us through this case. These images and videos were, were fantastic, and the illustrations were or wonderful. So thank you for, for putting that all together and uh, um, everyone have a good weekend. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right.